Hi, let's look at the answers to the practice paper H, paper one. So remember, this is non calculated Okay, question one, a straightforward subtraction fraction question. So option one is making top heavy, or you could deal with the whole numbers first, which is what I'm going to do. Four take away one is just three. Then you have to turn the third and the half into common denominator. So you do three times two is six. And start with the top left, one times two is two. And three times one is three. So you're left with two sixths take away three sixths. Now technically you can't do that. It's going to have to go borrow from the three. But right now I'm just going to leave that three as a whole number. Two take away three is minus one. So I've still to take away one sixth. Now I appreciate some people can just look at two take away three sixths and say, oh, that's take away one and work out what that is. But for those of you who can't, let's look at what this says. Three take away one sixth. So that means I'm going to have to borrow from the three. So if I borrow from the 3, that means I'm really using 2 and 6 sixths. That's the equivalent of 3. Take away 1 sixth, and then that leaves you with 2 and 5 sixths. Um, other acceptable answer, if you made it top heavy first and then did it, you could have possibly had 17 over 6 there. That would be acceptable as well. Question 2 is uh, expand the bracket. So the first thing we do is we times everything out by the 3. So that gives us 6x cubed, sorry, we times everything by 3x. 6x cubed plus 3x squared plus 15x. And then we multiply everything by the minus 2. Now I line this up underneath the x squared, so that gives me minus 4x squared, minus 2x, and minus 10. And then from there we tidy up the bits. Tidy up the x squared, uh, 3 take away 4 is minus 1, so minus 1x squared, 15 take away 2 is 13, so plus 13x take away 10. Okay? Question 3 is change the subject to formula. So the first thing I sometimes do is I rewrite this the other way around, so that the one we want is on the left-hand side. So we are trying to find um, what m is, okay? So remember, that is our target, to get m on its own. Now, we have to deal with the square root, we have to deal with a k, we have to deal with the, the, the k first of all because the square root is attached to the m. The k is, is a division on the left hand side, so the opposite dividing by k is times and by k. So you're left with root m equals k times l. You could all write, also write that as l times k, it doesn't matter which way down the letters go, all right, as long as they're stuck together like that. And then the opposite of taking the square root is squaring the other side. Now I would leave those terms in a bracket all squared. What you don't want to write is just that, because that looks like you've only got the squared with the L. But if you put the bracket round, it looks like everything's squared. The other alternative is you could square each of them individually, but I actually think this is probably the nicest way to write it. Question four is your vector pathway one. So we have to travel from A to D. So from A to D would be along here. So that's U plus U and then following V. So we're following the arrows all the time. So that is just u plus u plus v, which is 2u plus v. So that's part A. Part B, we have to find c to e. So the path from getting c to e, if I change my colour pen for this one. So c to e would be down this way, which is following v. And then along that way, which is going against the u, so that would be negative u. So v take away u. Okay. Okay, question five is your missing angle question. Um, I'm just going to read the information before I zoom this in and make it a bit bigger. So we've been told there's a tangent, so we're looking for some right angles. A diameter in a circle, so we're looking for right angle triangles again. And our aim here is to get the size of angle QRS. So QRS is this one down here. I'm just going to mark that one just now. Right, and then I'm going to zoom it in a wee bit. Okay, so let's think of those things you told us to look for. Tangent, radius meeting a tangent. So O to S is your radius. That means that this is a 90 degrees in here. Okay, so I'm just going to colour that in. We have a red 90 degree angle. This is also a triangle inside a semicircle. P to Q is your diameter. So PSQ has got a right angle. So there's also a right angle there, which I'm colouring in green. 
Okay, so a right angle triangle with inside a semicircle. We also have a right angle triangle here going from OS to R. Right, let's fill in what we can. Uh, also, always look for radiuses because they make isosceles triangles. So radius, radius, radius. Right, the first angle I'm tempted to fill in, remember there's more than one way to go here, is I'm tempted to put in that other 28 using symmetry. 28 add 28 is 56. So 180 take away 56 is 124. So this is for angle POS. So this is 124. That's on a straight line with 180, so that one makes that 56. Right, I actually have enough information to get the angle R now. If I just focus, let me highlight the triangle I'm using. If I just focus on this triangle here, I'm going round in yellow. If I focus on that one, I've got enough information. I've got 56 plus 90 is 146. My missing angle is 180 take away 146, which is 34. So the missing angle is 34. So the last thing to do is right angle um, SRO or SRQ is what they gave us, equals 34 degrees. Okay. Now, I could have also got these other angles. I'm just going to go fill all them in as well just now. So using this green right angle, um, the 100, sorry, 90 take away 6, sorry, uh, 90 take away 28 is 62. So using symmetry, that's also 62, which makes that 118 on a straight line. 90 take away 62 is 28. So I could have also used the 28, 118, which adds 146. Take that away from 180, it gives you 34 right. as well. Sorry, that was my dog barking. Um, please remember always to communicate your final answer. Put all your information on the diagram. That's the easiest way to mark it. If you're doing working at the side, you should be labeling it. So I did label one as POS. I didn't label that second one, but I should have done as SRQ. But on the diagram, make sure you communicate your final answer at the end so we know when you, you knew which one to find. Okay, question four is your standard factorise and then cancel down. Question, so on the top line, there's a common factor jumping out of 3y. That leaves behind y take away 2. On the bottom, that's a pair of brackets. Numbers that multiply to 6 and add to 1 are 3 and 2. It's going to be positive 3 take away 2. Then the minus 2s cancel out nicely. And that leaves you with 3y over y plus 3. Okay, the more you see of them, the better you get. Right, question 7 brings in the rule that the fractional powers, if you have a fractional power, the bottom becomes a root, the top stays put. That's my wee rhyme. So the n moves up in front of the square root. So in our case, it's a 2 that's going to move. So that is the square root of 9 cubed. Square root of 9, we don't ever write that number 2 though. So the square root of 9 is just 3. And 3 cubed is 3 times 3 times 3, which is 27. Okay. Question 8. Oh, a quadratic question. Okay, so... We are told what A is. I'm just going to put this in the diagram. So A is at minus 1 and B is at 5. We want the axis of symmetry. So axis of symmetry runs right down the middle. So you have to find what's in the middle of minus 1 and 5. That's a distance of 6. So the middle is 3 away from each number. So the middle is 2. So the equation of the axis of symmetry, any bit on that dotted line I've just drawn, has an x-coordinate of 2. So your equation of the line of symmetry is x equals 2. That's what that vertical line is called. Then it says find the maximum value of um, the trinomial. So you want the maximum value. It's a fancy way of asking you for the turning point. So the coordinate of this turning point is 2 something, right? We know what the x coordinate is. We need to get the y coordinate. So I'm just going to replace x with the number 2. So I've got y equals 5 plus 4 times 2 take away 2 squared, which is 5 plus 8 take away 4. 13 take away 4 is 9. So the maximum value of this, if they asked you for the turning point, you would say it was 2, 9. But because they just asked for the, asked for the maximum value, the maximum value is 9. It just wants to know, like, in terms of if, if this was throwing something in the air, the highest it would reach would be 9 metres or whatever it is. Okay, so just watch the wording. It wasn't actually asking for the turning point there, but really... Sorry, uh, really, that's what it is in context. Question 9 um, has two equations. You want the point of intersection. This is another way of doing 
simultaneous equations. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to rearrange these two equations because I'm not in a normal format. I like this one. That's okay because I've got my x plus my y is 14. I'm going to change this one. Okay, I'm going to bring the y over and I'm going to take the 3 over that way. So I'm going to have 2x minus y equals positive 3. Okay. Now, I always teach that you have to get the middle ones the same, so I need to times that bottom equation through by 2. So I've got x plus 2y equals 14. Um, 4x minus 2y equals 6. I don't need to worry about the sign, so I already had a plus and a minus there. So now I can just add them. x add 4x is 5x. 14 and 6 is 20, so that divides nicely. But it didn't divide nicely, guaranteed something's gone wrong. So x is 4, which also matches the picture. It could be a long 4. Now I know what x is, I'm going to go get y. I'm going to use that top equation because it's so much easier. So I've got 2 times 4, take away 3. y is then 8, take away 3, which is 5. And again, that matches the picture. So p is the coordinate for 5. So because I want the point of intersection, I don't leave it as x equals y equals. I leave it as a coordinate. And also my coordinate matches the picture, which is quite nice. So it would give you an indication if something's gone wrong if it didn't match. Question 10, nice straightforward um, cost graph. They want the values of a and b. So a is the highest number it goes to. So a equals 5 cos bx. Um, b is the number of waves. Now we have got, if we trace this just now, so there's one wave. There's two waves. Now those two waves finish at 180. That means I'd have another two waves if I kept this going up to 360. So this is a trick one here. So there would actually be four waves there. Another way of doing it is look at the number where your first wave finishes. If one wave finishes at 90, four 90s make 360. So that's why it's a 4x. Now you'd get away with writing just the equation. That's my personal preference. But you could also then write a equals 5, b equals 4. I just get into the habit of always writing the equation first. Question 11, um, this is a show that, so it's a trig and non-calculator. They're asking you to show that cos b equals 5 over 9. Now, cos b means they have started with your angle formula. So your angle formula would have been cos b equals a squared plus c squared minus b squared. Remember, it always starts and finishes with the same letter, all over 2ac. So I'm just going to go from there. So there's a... There's B, there's C, and hopefully we'll get down to what they've got. So cos B equals 6 squared plus 3 squared minus 5 squared, all over 2 times 6 times 3. So I've got 36 plus 9, take away 25, all over 36. Okay, 36 add 9 is 45, take away 25 is 20. 20 over 36, 4 times table, 5 over 9. So I've got the right answer. That's what they wanted. The trick with that one is starting it. Look at what they've given you. Cos B means an angle. They want angle B. Cosine formula should hopefully jump out. And you just have to do what you would normally do. It's not nice. I'd rather they much said um, find angle B um, without a calculator. Leave your answer as a fraction in its simplest form. But that would be too easy. Okay, question 12, um, find the area of a rectangle as a third. So just remember, back to basics, a rectangle is length times breadth. So your length times breadth is 2 root 3 times root 6. Now the rule with thirds is you can multiply the numbers underneath. So that gives you 2 root 18. Now root 18 can be simplified into root 9 times root 2. The square root of 9 is 3. And it's been multiplied by a 2 in front, so that gives you 6 root 2 in simplest form. Question 13 is your lovely bog standard smile and kiss. So kiss to start off with, the denominator becomes m bracket m plus 1. Smile start at the top left, gives you 3 bracket m plus 1, um, plus 4m. Please don't ever try and multiply out that bracket at the same time. Get this line in, because this line here is worth two marks. People who multiply it out at the same time and make a mistake, you can cost yourself. So times that out now, you have 3m plus 3 plus 4m, all over m bracket m plus 1. And I never ever multiply at the bottom line. 
that gives you 7m plus 3, all over m bracket m plus 1. Okay, they're nice ones if you can remember it. Okay, number 14, prove that the roots of this equation are real and irrational. Right, it's talking about um, nature of roots. So b squared minus 4ac. Um, so a is 2, b is 8, and c is 5. So b squared is 8 squared, which is 64. Take away 4 times 2 times 5, which is 64. Take away, well, I'm going to do the other way. 2 fives are 10 times 4 is 40. 64 take away 40 is 24. Right, so we have two real and distinct roots, first of all. Okay. And the reason we know that is because b squared minus 4ac is greater than zero. So we've got two real and distinct roots. So that's your bog standard, your normal question. This bit about irrational. Right, so remember when you do the discriminant, b squared minus 4ac in your quadratic formula, you normally square root it. When you square root 24, you don't get a nice answer, do you? You could say, oh, that's root 4 root 6, which is 2 root 6. That is an irrational number, all right? So the discriminant in this case is irrational, um, and 24 is, and the square root of 24 is irrational. I didn't like that question um, the time I saw it come up, but that's what they're asking you to do. So they're asking you to show that the roots are irrational. Basically, um, your roots are going to be decimals. It's, this doesn't factorise nicely. You'd be sitting there all day, right, trying to get um, values to put into brackets. And the reason it doesn't factorise, right, so the reason it doesn't factorise into a 2x and an x is because your roots are going to be decimals, okay? And that's all that means. And when it is decimals, that's when we go and do the quadratic formula. And this would work, but they're going to come out as decimals. And the fact is because of that, square root of the, the b squared minus 4ac bit. Anyway, it's, it's a tricky one.